Baconators, mount up. What's up? It's Rob Cressy, founder of Bacon Sports, and it's time to talk NFL division round playoffs action with my man from Covers.com, industry insider, Jason Logan. And Jason, this is actually episode 128 of the Bacon Sports podcast. Wowzers. Yeah, wowzers. So let's start this off like we do every time with your hashtag random athlete of the day. Sure. This isn't so much a random athlete as it is a random sports figure. Uh, Eugene Amosin. I don't know if you know that name. Rob, you might know it being in Chicago. That's the cameraman that Dennis Rodman kicked in the junk uh, way back in 1997 on this day back in 1997. So a little bit of sports history for you. Wow. You are digging deep, my friend. I, I, I had my coffee this morning, buddy. For me, let's keep it in Illinois. Celebrating a birthday today, former Northern Illinois running back LaShawn Johnson. <laughs> Randomness. Yeah, super random. So wow. what we're going to do, as we said, talk about the NFL betting lines for this upcoming weekend. But first, yep. you've got a fantastic prop bet. Yeah, uh, you know, it's not Super Bowl time yet, which is, you know, that's the Christmas of prop betting. Um, but now that we've kind of hit the playoffs and there's a lot of this off-field off drama going on, uh, some really interesting props are coming out. Uh, topbet.eu, online sportsbook. Uh, they threw a couple of cool prop bets out there uh, around two of the more controversial quarterbacks right now. Uh, they threw out odds on where RG3, Robert Griffin III, will play next year and where Johnny Football, Johnny Manziel, will play next year. So uh, as far as the RG3 odds, Houston is a 3-2 to two favorite, and Dallas, my Cowboys, slim 9-5 to five just behind them. Uh, Cleveland at 5-1, to one, St. Louis 8-1, to one, Philadelphia and San Francisco 15-1. Uh, to one, San Francisco, interesting with Chip Kelly going there. Maybe, you know, maybe he wants that kind of dynamic dual threat running back if RG3 is healthy. Uh, Miami and the Jets are 25-1, to one, the Bears 30-1, to one, and this is the greatest one. Here is any CFL team 100-1. to one. Ooh, RG3 at 70% would be awesome. I always thought Michael Vick would come and play after the whole dog fighting thing, come and play at least a year in the CFL. And I was so interested just to see what he would do with that space. Um, you look at the Manziel odds, and they've actually had the Manziel ones up for a little while, and they've taken action on them and moved them around. Um, Houston was at 15-1. to one. It got bet down to 12-1, to one, and now it's 8-1. to one. Um, And then they've also taken a lot of action on the CFL which is amazing. Uh, that opened 50 to one down to 30 to one. Now that's 25 to one. So, you know, maybe uh, I can make the drive to Toronto and go see Johnny football play for the Argos next year. Who knows? Um, you, Dallas has, has moved around a little bit. They were at even money. Now they're at six to five. Uh, Cleveland going back to Cleveland, four to one Rams, five to one Eagles, eight to one San Francisco, 12 to one. This is where the value lies. Like I said, Chip Kelly, he's the new coach in San Francisco. And this is a guy who, recruited Johnny Manziel, almost had him in Oregon. And uh, and I believe there were some inquiring, too, that he almost had him in Philadelphia. So maybe Johnny Football is his, you know, maybe this is the, the golden goose. Maybe this is his long sought after what could have been. Um, so a lot of value there, 12 to 1. Bears, 30 to 1. Miami, tw uh, 25 to 1. And New England, who loves their troubled players, uh, 25 to 1. Hey, they took a shot on Tebow, so why wouldn't they take a shot on Manziel? So... I would rather have RG3 than Johnny Manziel, without a doubt. RG3 has shown so much more. He is less of a cancer than Johnny Football. I would also consider parlaying the CFL Johnny Football <laughs> with CFL RG3. That would be great there. Um, that would be an awesome, that would be an awesome gray cup. <laughs> if you're be a, a 49ers gray fan, cup I could certainly see the uh, RG3 side of things. But I would be really concerned uh, with Chip Kelly there knowing the overhaul he did unsuccessfully in Philadelphia of him bringing in someone like Johnny Manziel, which uh, I feel like they need to do things not above board, but Chip Kelly seemed like he was such an extremist with doing things his way. I'd be a little bit concerned that you're bringing in trouble again when oftentimes it seems with an organization you want calmer waters. Well, I don't know if it can get any worse than it was in San Francisco this season. Um, so, I mean, bringing in Manziel, 
just kind of uh, kind of par for the course for the Niners right now. If your Dallas Cowboys brought him in, what would your thoughts be? Um, I like him as a better backup than what we have, honestly. Um, you know, the Castle Show and the Brandon Whedon Show were just, you know, I could sit through those. And uh, I don't think Kellen Moore's the guy. So, I mean, they bring him in as a backup. Hey, Dallas loves their trouble players. They brought in Greg Hardy, who's a monster. Uh, they brought him in, and, and obviously they've had their uh, they've trouble shot with some other uh, talented yet troubled players in the past, too. So it uh, wouldn't surprise me. I know Jerry Jones loves him and, and almost had to be – he had to be talked off of the ledge uh, come that draft not to pick him up. Um, it'd be inter- it's interesting to see, uh, you know, if this is a guy who can get his head on straight. But uh, you're playing on that stage, the Dallas Cowboys stage, whether they're good or bad, they're still one of the more popular teams, and that's a lot of pressure to put on a young guy. I would put my money on the Dallas Cowboys for Johnny Manziel. I feel like that's the fit. Uh, unfortunately, even if he is a better backup, uh, th- that's not the issue with G- Johnny Manziel. Or not the biggest issue. It's all the other stuff that would come around it of Tony Romo's aging. He threw two interceptions. When is it time to look oh, towards yeah. the future? Well, that's that's kind of where Romo was when Romo took over from Bledsoe. It was the same thing, you know. Bledsoe was was declining. Now, I think Romo's in a much better spot than Bledsoe was when when Romo knocked him off the, for the starting job. Um, you know, Romo, when healthy, is still. I mean, I'm going to say one of the top five quarterbacks in the league, and you can argue with me all you want, but we don't have all day for that. So. Right. All right. Cool. So let's move to this weekend's lines, and uh, let's just go game by game since we only have four of them. Uh, and then you can let me know who the Sharps are on or if there's a super public team, uh, and then if one of these games is the game that the books are sweating the most, it'll just sort of cover all our bases. Okay, yeah, yeah, we can mix it up here. Hopefully I don't miss anything. Cool. First game, we got the Chiefs taking on Patriots. Patriots, five-and-a-half point favorites at home, over-under is 42. And Mm. for me, when I look at this, Bill Belichick versus Andy Reid, Tom Brady versus Alex Smith. Mm-hmm. Uh, this the, and we talk about sharp money. This has been uh, kind of the, the predominant sharp game. Uh, sharp guys like Kansas City money line, taking them at plus one ninety, and uh, and they've also bet this uh, that the most sharp action has been on the under for this game. Opened I believe forty four and a half, uh, down to forty two now. There was some bad weather in the forecast for this game, which is why I think a lot of the sharp money was trying to get ahead of that before you know people. Oh, it's going to be terrible in New England, and people bet it and it kept going it down. Uh, but right now, it looks like everything's going to blow over. So you could see this total go back up uh, as people, you know, see what Kansas City did last week against Port Houston. And they love to bet uh, the Patriots over just because of what Tom Brady and, and all those weapons. And he gets Edelman back. So um, that's a big thing, too. Um, opened as low as four and a half. Pat's money took it to five and a half. And then they got some buyback on uh, Kansas City. So you're seeing five, five and a half out there. I think it's probably going to settle around five or so, which is which is. An odd, it's, it's a bit of a dead number, but books are being a little more cautious with these dead numbers now. They're not just going from four and a half up to six. They're sticking there because you're seeing missed field goals, or sorry, missed extra points, and you're seeing two-point conversions, and you're seeing some odd final scores come out. So they're not they're not as eager to jump over the dead number uh, now. So that's why you're seeing this one still bouncing like four and a half, five, five and a half, and not going six. And I don't think we're going to see six. So I know that the Chiefs, I think they've won 11 straight. One, I haven't been overly impressed with the teams that they have beaten. I think yeah. uh, the Broncos were the best team there. It uh, doesn't look like they're going to have Jeremy Macklin there. Their running game doesn't exactly scare me there. Uh, I know their defense is good, but what is – it's like I'm having to figure out how am I going to convince myself. And I like taking the underdogs because that's where the value is. Mm-hmm. But when looking at it, I'm still just trying to figure out – is the public perception that everyone's trying to throw on us with the Chiefs in this narrative of they're hot, they beat Brian Hoyer and the Texans. I get 30 nothing. That's great that yeah. they did that. But it was still also Brian Hoyer that they beat. And there's nothing that says if I'm backing the Chiefs that, uh, God forbid, they got down 10 to nothing or something. I just don't see the confidence there. And I know Andy Reid can be a good coach, but gamblers also know he can be a kryptonite and inexplicably be the worst time manager and kill you that way. Yeah, and I mean, and then he's matching up against, you know, the evil empire. He's matching up against, uh, you know, Belichick. And, and Belichick's the, he's the great mind behind it all. The biggest thing in this game, and like you had mentioned, Macklin um, could be out. And even if he is in and he's playing on that bum wheel, 
that takes away their deep threat. And that's one thing that's, that made Kansas City a great team. If you look at that winning streak, you saw the chemistry build between Macklin and Alex Smith. And once they got on the same page and they had that deep ball, which is something they haven't had for years, they were a very one-dimensional offense. And, and now you've, you've seen them be able to spread the field, spread the defense, and, and, and now teams, you know, teams are going to have to you know, respect that uh, rather than just knowing that they can't throw over top. They're just going to go in underneath now because Macklin's gone uh, or maybe injured. That's not there. And that was the one weakness that the Pats had. They were, they were one of the worst teams against the deep ball. I believe they gave up 36 passing plays of 25 yards or more this year, which uh, I wrote it down here, but it was one of the, it was one of the, yeah, it was sixth most in the NFL, which is surprising for a defense, but this is a new England defense that will bend and not break. They get into the red zone and they're a little more solid. Uh, but now without Macklin, the offense becomes very one-dimensional again. And like you said, the running game isn't what it was. Uh, it's really Alex Smith with his legs and Travis Kelsey as a safety blanket. It is also worth noting on the flip side, the strength of the Chiefs defense is stopping the run, which is relatively irrelevant because Steven Jackson is currently the number one running back for the Patriots, meaning the Patriots are more likely to pass the ball more often, more susceptible there. I will say anytime I think the Patriots are going to do one thing. So if, you know, they're going to, Oh, they're going to pass the ball a lot more then they do the exact opposite. And it works. I don't know. Belichick works that magic, but every time I think they're going to do something, you know, I think they zig and they zag. Yeah. I'm going to be on the Patriots. I just can't, uh, I just can't take the chiefs. I know that Tom Brady also doesn't have the best against the spread record in the playoffs, but for me, this is a gut on not believing in the chiefs, even though a low scoring game the Patriots could win 17-13, boom, there's a cover for the Chiefs, and that's a scenario I could totally see, but I just can't do it. Yeah, that uh, it'll be definitely an interesting uh, matchup of minds with Reed and, and Belichick. Uh, that's going to be a really interesting coaching dynamic in this game. All right, cool. Next game we're going to talk about Green Bay Packers taking on the Cardinals. Cardinals seven-point favorites over under 50, highest on the board. And once again, let's look at the quarterbacks. Carson Palmer has zero career playoff victories. Aaron Rodgers has a Super Bowl. The Cardinals, uh, definitely a team that people think could win the Super Bowl. Love the balance they have on offense. Uh, the weapons they have are significantly better than what Green Bay has. On the flip side, Green Bay's offense is a shell of what it was last year, uh, going from like first in offense to 24th in offense. James Jones is the number one wide receiver now, not Randall Cobb, at least in terms of targets. You've got Eddie Lacy and James Starks there. But uh, I like getting a touchdown with the reigning MVP who has been in this situation. Uh, no Tyron Matthew for the Cardinals, and perception is very heavy on the Cardinals, and I think that there could be some value on this Packers team. Yeah, uh, this one opened with a, with a half point hook on that. So you saw seven and a half uh, out there and it, it immediately dried up. It was gone right down to a touchdown. And talking to bookmakers, um, I think that's where they're going to keep it. They they really don't want to take this down to six and a half. Uh, so, if it, you know, the Packers are going to have their, as the tourists come to town in Las Vegas and as the public guys log on to their accounts, um, especially after watching Green Bay look like Green Bay last week. Um, you know, the betting public kind of has the memory of a goldfish and they remember the more, more recent things. They don't remember those offensive struggles as well as what they saw last week. So they, you know, thinking that Green Bay's back, but this is, this is a game that they really want to stay at seven at. Uh, they think it's the right number. And when it comes to playoff time like this, the numbers are pretty solid. Like we know the teams really, really well. The books know the teams really, really well. So the numbers that come out, they're not going to change all that much unless there's some really one-sided action. So whether it's this game or any other playoff game, um, betters really want to pay attention to the juice, that VIG, the price. Um, so, you know, if, if they're at minus 115, uh, you know, you've got to bet $115 to win 100. Um, so it's, you know, pay attention to that because that's how the books are going to try to balance the action on this game. You're not going to get a line move down to six. The Sharps are waiting for that. You know, it's like a dangling piece of meat over the uh, over the wolf pack there. You know, they're waiting to bite that. But I don't think they're going to get to bite it. I think it's going to stay at seven. The odds makers are going to get creative with the VIG on this game and, and try to keep it at that key number. Um, because, you know, if they if you had someone bet seven and a half and then they bet the six and a half, and that land, game lands seven, which is a very common number that it lands on, uh, you know, books could get middled and get stung on, on a big playoff game. 
So one thing about the Packers is that everyone's like, oh, they're they're back. Yeah, except we forget the fact they were down 11 to nothing and had Deshaun Jackson actually got that ball into the end zone, we could have been looking at a completely different outcome there. And another thing that does concern me on the Green Bay side is their offensive line. I believe they were starting a left tackle that had converted from center. He may or may not have been a rookie. I don't remember. But uh, you saw the first uh, score of the game was a safety there. If the wide receivers aren't getting open good enough uh, and Aaron Rodgers has less time, that's what uh, concerns me with Green Bay. Yeah, uh, I mean, he got sacked nine times the last time they played Arizona. Um, the one thing, and I looked at this in my weekly mismatches column, is that Arizona, because of the way that they are very aggressive, they blitz, they throw a lot at the quarterback, they are susceptible to running backs on those short dump passes and then picking up big yards. And the one bright spot from that last meeting with Arizona was Eddie Lacy. He had a 28-yard catch and run, and they threw you know six guys at, uh, at Rodgers. He felt the pressure, he dumped it off, and Eddie Lacy had a open lane right down the middle of the field, rumbled for a touchdown. And it was, like I said, it was one of the lone, lone bright spots in that game. Uh, but Arizona this year has shown a vulnerability to giving up those yards. Um, you know, they'll blitz and hopefully they have the guys to close in, uh, at, you know, after the running back catches the ball. But, but it's, they've been giving up big yards to running backs. You have James Starks, who's a terrific uh, catch and run. And Eddie Lacy, as he showed in that play, and he, as he's shown uh, a few times this season, you know, he can catch a ball and run with it too. And once he gets ahead of steam, he's tough to take down. So it's one of those mismatches I'm looking at right now is is that uh, receiving running backs versus Arizona's uh, blitz-happy defense. All uh, right. What side are the Sharps on? Uh, for this one, uh, the early money did take the Packers at the half-point hook. Um, so that would be the initial sharp play. And since then, um, there has been a lot of Arizona money. Um like I said, it, it's. It, I don't think it's going to get the six and a half. I think you're going to see some public play on the Packers as, uh, you know, Joe Average better comes in and, and looks at what they did last week. Um, but I, I think it's going to be at seven. I think the Sharps bought um, Green Bay seven and a half. It came down and they're waiting to get Arizona at six and a half. But I just don't think it's going to go the other way. All right, cool. Next game, Seahawks taking on the Panthers. Panthers one and a half point favorites over under 43 and a half and this line has moved a bunch i know i think it was it, i've seen it anywhere from one and a half to three yesterday was at two and a half now it's down it's, to one and a half here it's down it's actually down to one now wow uh, at some places yeah yeah uh which is bonkers because you know seattle just shouldn't they shouldn't be there they shouldn't be there you know uh my kid could have kicked that blair walsh uh field goal there to win the game like and my poor brother is a Vikings fan, too. So I called him and told him, you know, as a Cowboys fan, I sympathize with you because I, too, have been burned by Seattle on a botched field goal in the wild card round. If you remember, oh, the bobble yeah. hold by Romo, terrible memories. I'm trying to suppress all that down and not think about that. But, um, yeah, like, you know, they shouldn't be there. But this is people seeing Seattle as a very playoff savvy team uh, playing well at the end of the year. And uh, and Carolina just continuing to get no love. Like, you know, this is the best team in the NFC uh, with the best player in the league and continue to get zero love. So, yeah, it's come down from three to one. Um, now, this move could be, and talking to bookmakers, this could be a little more of a precaution, knowing that Seattle money is going to come in this weekend um, because that's, you know, the public is in love with Seattle. Um, so they bump it down and they try to get some Carolina money before – uh, that public comes in. So they're just trying to balance it out a little bit, be a little proactive uh, about their, their odds making right now. I feel like the perception of the Seahawks is a little out of whack right now. And as you said, not as much on the Panthers. For me, I like the Panthers in this game because I got a lot of positive things that I can say about the Panthers. I don't know if I can say the same with the Seahawks, who, as you said, are lucky to have gotten by the Vikings. They lost at home to the Rams, what, three weeks ago, so by no means are they this juggernaut. Marshawn Lynch, even if he does play, what's his effectiveness going to be? He hasn't been great yeah. this year. Um, and, and and Carolina went into CenturyLink Field and beat them this year, which is a tough, tough thing to do. I mean, Seattle doesn't just drop games at home, and uh, Carolina went in and looked good, looked confident. Right, and if we're looking once again at quarterback play, Russell Wilson versus Cam Newton, certainly you're going to say the edge goes to the experienced Russell Wilson, but 
Cam Newton this year, MVP of the NFL. I feel confident with what Cam's got going on in Carolina. I also like the defense of Carolina. Luke Keekley, Josh Norman, they can get pressure there. I just don't know if there's as many weapons on Seattle and Seattle not as good against tight ends. Greg Olson, the number one target for Carolina. That, well, the thing is, too, is that he's, well, he's really the only, he's kind of the only option for Cam Newton. Um, and Seattle has some really athletic guys. They have athletic linebackers. They have bigger safeties. They they have some options to slow him down. Um, and one thing, and it was in the Washington Post this week, uh, Jeff Dooley from the Washington Post did a great breakdown, and one of the things that he looked at was Cam Newton and how he's impacted by pressure in the pocket. And uh, with, in a clean pocket, he has a uh, 112.8 QB rating, which is much higher than the 98.2 NFL average. But when the pocket starts to pressure, uh, sorry, when the pocket starts to, to, to close up and he, he has pressure, um, his QB rating uh, dips to 66.9, which is under the league average of 71.5 in a collapsing pocket. So he's been terrific when he has time to throw the ball, and he's been subpar when there's pressure on him. So, uh, you know, we could see Cam scrambling for his life in this, but if he has to make throws, I mean, this is a, a Seattle defense that, thrives on pressure they don't necessarily get a lot of sacks but they hurry the quarterback they get in his face and uh you know bennett's doing an amazing job cliff, cliff averill is is probably one of the more underrated players in the league right now i mean this guy's playing phenomenally and the two of them are just they're 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 making quarterbacks poop their pants pretty much and so it's you know they're they're putting pressure on him and we could see cam make some mistakes and that that's where seattle's you know secondary comes in and uh, that's where they thrive is on that chaos and those mistakes. To me, that is the game of the weekend right there. Uh, I like it. Yeah, yeah. It should be really, really interesting. I, I, I'm pulling for Carolina uh, just because I love Cam Newton. I'd love to see him, you know, do what he does. So That makes two of us. All right, last game of the weekend. My Pittsburgh Steelers taking on the Denver Broncos. Broncos now favored by seven and a half. And just moments before we shot this podcast, you let me know, no Antonio Brown for the Steelers in this game. Absolutely devastating. Uh, I don't believe there's an over underline out, probably because of the uncertainty of both D'Angelo Williams and Big Ben Roethlisberger. But depending on what's up with Ben, this line certainly could shoot up even higher. Uh, I can see it. Could it creep up nine and a half or ten if Landry Jones is in there? Oh, we- Eas- easily, easily. I'm um, talking to Ozmakers uh, at the end of last week's games and knowing that Roethlisberger was hurt, knowing Antonio Brown was concussed and knowing that D'Angelo Williams was still uh, probably a no-go. They were saying this line could be anywhere from four to 10. And I think 10 is actually a bit of a, a, an under-exaggeration. I mean, that's what they'll put up there and the public will see all these guys out and uh, and jump on that. And, De- you know, Denver at home, I think it could go 10 and a half, 11. It'll, it'll go as high as the public wants to bet Denver. Um, However, the one thing with this, and it looks like Ben is going to play, but he's going to be pretty limited in what he can do. He can't throw that deep bomb, which is something that that's that the Steelers really rely on. I mean, they were the deep bomb team in the NFL this year. They led the league in passing plays of 25 yards or more. Antonio Brown was the recipient on, on almost all of those. Um, but even if Brown was in, I don't know how effective he would have been. He almost would have been more of a decoy. Uh, you know, dragging dragging a uh, a defender or two with him out, and then maybe opening stuff up underneath because Ben just can't throw the ball with his you know his shoulders basically in tatters. Um, so it, there might be a bit of an overcorrection. You know, if you're someone that likes to find the line value, and if, if this line does go up to seven and a half, um, and I'm not sure if it has since the the news came out, but if it does go up to seven and a half, you may be getting great value with the Steelers because Antonio Brown even if he was in this game, may not have had a big impact on the game to begin with just because Ben can't can't throw it to him. Um, so really interesting way to view the line for this one. Um, and that's and but then you also have Ben in a dumbed down offense, you know, not being able to throw the deep ball against the top pass defense in the league and the top pass rush in the league. So knowing that he can't throw it deep, uh, you know, Denver could just bring the house. These guys lead the league in sacks. They got just nasty, nasty pass rush. Uh, you know, playmakers on the other side and, and the secondary as well too. So uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see. I think we're going to see a lot of two tight end sets, 
trying to protect uh, Ben Roethlisberger a little more. And I think we're going to see a lot of hurry-up offense as well, too. Uh, just trying to get Denver on its heels, maybe not get set and get those subs in, um, especially with Brown out. Uh, I'm not sure with Williams. It's, it sounds like he's not going to play. I don't know if they've actually made a decision on that. But, uh, you know, not having him out, too, is, is a huge thing. Because he's a guy who can catch passes as well, too. He's just stepped up and been a tremendous player for them, uh, especially when Le'Veon Bell was out early and then when he got hurt uh, midway through the year. So, worth noting in the first game the Steelers played against the Broncos, Ben Roethlisberger lit them up for 380 yards passing. Uh, of course, we're probably going to see a different scenario in Denver with injury. Could this mean more Heath Miller, safety net type guy? Uh, also, you know what I love as a Steelers fan? All Given all the circumstances, this could not be set up better because Peyton Manning is the quarterback for the Denver Broncos. And I believe it, I think it's in the last five games, Peyton Manning has thrown three touchdowns and 10 interceptions. Uh, that's, that's, that's two full hands right there, Rob. Two full hands. That's two full Ten. hands. Uh, and, and if you remember, um, this wouldn't be the first matchup this year where Peyton Manning had a juicy uh, scenario. He had to go to overtime to beat the Den or to beat the Cleveland Browns. And Peyton Manning has a losing record in the playoffs for his career, and the majority of the time, he has been a, the favorite. So this year, Peyton Manning, as much as he wants to win, he's aging, he's got a noodle arm, and he's turned the ball over a ton. So if I'm going to create a narrative for how the Steelers cover, God forbid, win, it is by defensive turnovers and or maybe they take one to the house. This Steelers defense uh, can be opportunistic, uh, I like what very, Ryan Shazier very, very been doing. Very often, and this is something that you and I had talked about all year: is that like they're not a tremendous team, but they make plays. You know, they're not solid on every down, but they when they got to make a play, they make a play. And I believe they're among the better teams in takeaways this year. And like you said, you throw Peyton Manning; you don't know if he's going to be extra motivated to do, you know, pull back the years and and do what he does, but. Uh, yeah, he's definitely walking into a defense that, that loves to make that big play or at least try to make that big play. And speaking of not being able to blow the roof off the doors, do you really have to worry as much about Demarius Thomas burning you with a 60-yard pass and Peyton Manning also probably can't throw deep? I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what Peyton Manning, if a little bit of rest and a little bit of humility uh, perhaps because I mean I, I think he might have been a little he he could have been ready to go and they still stuck with Osweiler so I think I think it, it may have lit a fire under him uh, from what I've read is that Peyton Manning is a little more jacked up for this game than he has been in any other game uh, during his Denver career like he's pretty excited um, and you know Peyton Manning with motivation maybe that's what was lacking the last couple uh, you know for well, a good chunk of the season maybe he just wasn't feeling it. And uh, now that he's had to uh, taste a pine and, uh, and a bit, you know, a bit of a, a career eye opener and some time off, maybe he comes back uh, with guns blazing. You know, I think that's what people want to believe. Um, I think people want that nice Cinderella story for him to ride off into the sunset kind of, but I mean, the stats do speak for themselves. Who would you rather have starting at quarterback? If you I were love a these Steelers games. Fan? Blake, Blake or Brock Osweiler or Peyton Manning, because for me, I would rather Peyton Manning because Brock Osweiler, while he doesn't have the experience, uh, we saw what he did in the first half against the Steelers letting him up. He's got the better arm. So for me, I'm happy Peyton Manning's the quarterback. Yeah, I mean, Peyton Manning is a much smarter game manager. Um, but yeah, I mean, Osweiler gives the, gives the offense a, a little more of a dimension. Um, you know, same way that Ben would if he was able to throw deep. So, uh, yeah. Uh, in a playoff game, though? Yeah. We're talking this game. Who would I want to see? Yeah. Your Cowboys are in this game. Same situation. You get to go. Cowboys are in this game. Woo! Rob, you made my day. <laughs> um, who would they rather see? Peyton Manning. Um, I, I, I think I would go with Osweiler just because of playoff experience. You want a guy in there that might be a little overwhelmed by the big stage. And Osweiler's uh, being dinged up. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I I'd still I'd still respect Peyton Manning for everything that he can do or did do. Gotcha. Cool. So, Jason, time to dish some plugs. What do you guys got going on at covers.com? 
Yeah, it's a big weekend. Uh, you know, we do our college season is is over with, but now we're focused on the NFL playoffs here. I've got my mismatches column is up right now. I've got some really cool stuff from the Harvard uh, Sports Analysis Collective. They looked at home field advantage with the road team sweeping last week, and they looked at you know is that changing and should betters kind of change the way that they feel about home field advantage. Um, I'll have my muff pun calling out coming out. Uh, that's a column that I'll have coming out today. Should be up this afternoon. Some really cool stats in that. Uh, I won't give away anything, but some really, really neat stats uh, as it is pertaining to teams coming off blow up, blow up, uh, blow out wins like Kansas city and also rematches. We have three rematches uh, on the slate this weekend. So looking at ATS and straight up records, in playoff rematches from the regular season. So some really cool numbers there, some eye-opening numbers there. Uh, we'll have our cheat sheet on Twitter where, you know, we're, we've got constant information coming from the books, line moves, injury updates, weather updates. It's something you got to keep an eye on this time of year. Uh, but then also, to the NBA, college is going on. There's some big things going on. NHL is still going. Uh, Aussie Open opens Monday. Uh, so if you love your tennis, uh, the Aussie Open's coming. We'll have previews on that stuff too. So uh, anything under the under the sports betting umbrella, we've got it. It's all free. Our editorial content, our matchups, our stats, our Twitter feed. You don't pay for it. It's all free. It's all great information. Awesome. As always, Jason, thanks for coming on and have a fantastic NFL playoff weekend. You as well. I missed you. I missed you over these last few weeks. I so, missed you. Uh, happy, happy to be back, buddy. That makes two of us, my friend. Cheers.